Welcome, Susan. Thank you. I'm really excited that you're here. I love talking to you on the phone, and I, I thought it would be so wonderful for you to share how you feel about the whole 9-11 experience. So you were really the last person in your family to talk to your dad, right? Yes, I spoke to him around 8.20, right before I was going in the shower, and I answered the phone, and he was in a panic, where's my cell phone? And I said, oh, mommy took it, you know, hers was broken. And so then he proceeded, what are you doing? And I said, getting ready to go in the shower, <laughs> you know? And I said, go back to work, do something with yourself, and make some money, I love you. <laughs> and he said, I love you. And I went in the shower, and I came out, and I didn't know, but at that time, you know, the plane had gone into the towers. My boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, called, and I hear one of my mom's friends saying, something happened in Billy's building, something happened in Billy's building. And I said to my husband, I said, I have to, I have to go. And I, he's like, I'm on my way. He must have known what had happened. And I just ran downstairs. I turned the TV on. And I went straight for the phone. Then the last I remember is just people coming into my house and coming into my house. Do you know for sure that he had perished? Or what did you no, think? No, because my father was in the 93 bombing. They said, if ever something should happen again, don't go down 104 flights, go up, because it was only to go up three flights. So from what we know is they were on the roof waiting oh. for um, a helicopter. Little did we know there was no way that a plane was getting there. And then what happened? Then I just remember, I remember my brother saying, it was maybe a day or two later, like, when do we start accepting condolences? I just remember nonstop crying. Really, I, I heard that there were a thousand people at your father's service. Yeah, he must have been a very loved and admired man. Very, you know, he had a heart of gold. He was just generous. He would help anybody that ever needed help. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandmother raised him by a motto: "If you have it, you give it." Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he did. He just kind of just kept giving it forward. He sounds like a great guy, and you were a real. You said you're the epitome of a daddy's girl. I definitely, definitely, definitely was, and it's it's a big loss now not having that special connection. You know, it's interesting. Every time I pictured my wedding, it was it ended at my dad and I dancing. Oh. It's a butterfly kisses. It was more about that than it was about anything else. And you know, I look at my life today. I got married without him. I had three kids without him. You know, it's it's a whole world later. I know that we all deal with grief in different ways. How did you deal with your grief? At first I was, you know, and still to this day at some point, um, so angry. I was walking with my mother one day and there was so much anger and there was a father and a son riding a bike and I was like, okay, who should we take out first? <laughs> like, you know, I was like, this can't be productive. I decided to channel it in a more positive way. And I came home and my mother and my brother were in the kitchen and I said, I'm starting a foundation. And I started a caring hand, the Billy Esposito Foundation. And we opened it up for education because my father was very passionate about education. In the beginning, we couldn't give the money away because there were so many people doing scholarships, especially for 9-11. My brother and I were at a bereavement center in Rockville Center in Long Island. And he said, you know, what good is the money for scholarships if the kids aren't grieving the loss, you know, of their loved one? So I said, excellent point. So with that, I was off and running on a whole new tangent. And in 2008, we opened up the first non-clinical freestanding bereavement center hmm. to help children who have lost a loved one. Right. When I was going through 9-11, it was you know, a worldwide thing, obviously, as we know. But I felt like my, friend, my friends didn't understand what I was going through. They couldn't fathom what it was like. And I didn't want other kids to feel like not understood. Yes. And we don't give anybody a diagnosis code, oh, this child's depressed, oh, this child is anxious. For the first time, like whether a child is crying or whether he's screaming, they're totally understood mm -hmm. because the other kid can really get what they're going through. Right. Is there anything else you'd like to say about your dad? No, I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about him and miss him and, you know, wish he was here and wonder what life would be like yeah. if he was here. Well, you're very smart and brave and, and strong, and, and I think the fact that you've taken something that could be, you know, really a negative influence in your life, you've turned it into something positive. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really inspiring, Susan. It, yeah, it really you. is. It makes, makes me want to do better in my life. Thanks so mm -hmm. much for being with us. Thank you.